In the traditional motion picture story, the villains are usually defeated. The ending is a happy one. I can make no such promise for the picture you're about to watch. The story isn't over. You and the audience are part of the conflict. More human beings were slaughtered in the 20th century than all previous centuries combined. We're talking a congressional record, 135 million dead. Their entire purpose was to detach our culture from any moral anchors whatsoever. You look at the changes in America since 1960, perhaps, the, the whole culture has been transformed. They're coming out of the belief that the village should raise the child. Uh, and the village means the government. They have deliberately destroyed the American family, understanding that's the foundational block that uh, builds a society. We've come from uh, Norman Rockwell's America to, uh, you know, Hugh Hefner's America. If we lose the Judeo-Christian framework, we're lost forever. The left wants you to think that the cultural changes that have taken place in America since the 1960s have done nothing but progress us forward toward a brave new world. They look at what holds society together, they understand it, but they don't want that. They want change, and they will subvert and rot every good and decent thing we believe in because they have a vision for a new society, and that must mean the replacement of the old society. This film will show that the brave new world they seek is nothing more than the failed policies and ideologies of the communism that enslaved over a third of the world's population during the 20th century. It will show that most people on the left aren't communist, just the useful idiots Lenin spoke of being used to promote a socialist agenda which is the first and necessary step toward communism. They basically try to say that the state itself is ultimate, that there's nothing, no law higher than the state, and if there's no law higher than the state, there's no appeal against it. History has proven beyond any doubt that the free enterprise that freedom produces provides more for anyone willing to work than any other system. So why would the left still be pushing their socialist agenda on us? I mean, it's really just microwave communism. There's only two possibilities. They're either ignorant or they're evil. From my investigation over the last two years into what has caused America's drastic decline, I'm sorry to say the left won't be able to use the ignorant card. They've left too much evidence of their agenda in their books, articles, and speeches. No, America has an enemy that is getting very close to accomplishing its plan of destroying the greatest country in all world history. Once people figure it out, they're going to do what people everywhere do, they're going to start protesting and they're going to start revolting. And when that happens, that's when the powers that be feel threatened and they use the power that they have.
This story really begins for me back in the summer of 1992. I got a phone call from an older gentleman I knew who was a writer, and he asked me if I'd go attend a meeting for him at the University of California, Berkeley. He told me that the Communist Party USA had recently split over differences of how to best take America down. Some were wanting to still work toward a violent revolution, while others were wanting to focus their efforts on using public policy to subvert America from the inside. He was curious what they had to say. I mean, after all, the Berlin Wall had just come down, the Soviet Union had dissolved, and the whole world was saying, communism is dead. So why were they meeting, and what were they up to? I was in graduate school at the time, and the whole idea of slipping in undercover into a communist meeting sounded pretty neat, so I decided to go. The first surprise I had was when I walked into the auditorium. I was expecting it to be filled with college radicals, but instead it was 50, 60, and 70-year-olds, I mean grandparents, professionally dressed with briefcases, and I realized this might be a little more serious than I thought. As the weekend unfolded, I listened carefully as they outlined their plan and agenda and how they were going to infiltrate the institutions of America to influence us in the direction they wanted us to go. To destroy our families, they wanted to promote cohabitation instead of marriage. They wanted to try to get children away into government programs at the earliest age possible. And they also said they'd like to get behind the feminist movement because they felt it had been very successful in making women discontent with marriage and motherhood. To destroy business, they wanted to get behind the environmental movement. And in 1992, the environmental movement was very modest, but they thought it was the only vehicle capable of creating enough regulation and red tape to discourage business growth. And finally, to destroy our culture of religion and morality, they said, if we could get Americans to accept homosexuality, they thought it would begin to extinguish our traditional moral values Americans held. I remember thinking at the time, this plan doesn't seem very realistic. It's not something I'll need to worry about in my lifetime. It was 15 years later, I was appointed by the governor to be a state representative in the legislature. I'd only lived in my district for two years, so I thought it'd be a good idea if I wrote a monthly letter to the editor. Each month I wrote on a different topic. In January 2008, as I was contemplating what to write my letter on, I thought back to the meeting in 1992, and I thought of the goals they'd outlined, and where America was today, and I couldn't believe how successful they had been. I mean, our families were totally disintegrating, the environmental movement had become the most powerful force for destroying our free markets, and hate crimes legislation was being considered in Washington, D.C. that made it a crime to even say anything against the homosexual movement. I realized people needed to know what was going on. After I wrote this letter, within days, people were protesting at the Capitol, it was the feature story on the evening news. Controversial comments have state legislators buzzing tonight. After a freshman lawmaker alleges the communist agenda has infiltrated mainstream America. It's the big story, live at 6. And over 40 letters to the editor had been printed in response to what I'd said. Hey, I just wanted to give you support on your newspaper article. Don't let them grind you down. Bye. I realized then I'd hit on something. One of the letters written in my defense stated that a book from 1958 had outlined a similar agenda. And this got my attention. The book was The Naked Communist by Cleon Skousen, who had been a former FBI agent. And inside the book, it documented 45 current communist goals from 1958. And as I slowly read through the list, seeing how specific their agenda had been to subvert us on the inside, I couldn't believe it.
They'd accomplished almost every single one of them, and nobody seemed to be noticing. For at least the last 50 years, they'd been working actively behind the scenes, in the shadows, trying to move our people and our culture in a direction that was designed to destroy us. Someone needed to find out the truth of what had happened to our country. Could all of these very specific goals have been accomplished by accident? Or was there something there, under the surface, intentionally rotting away America's culture? I decided to go and get the facts from some of my favorite writers and speakers around the country. These are a few of the questions I asked them. The common myth is that communism is dead, but there are more Communist Party members in the world today than there ever have been. One of the things the Communists are, are doing worldwide is not using that name. Uh, and so what we have is people with some of the same ideas uh, masquerading in the United States uh, under a variety of names. They're even trying to uh, get away from the word liberal uh, to describe them, uh, and they're trying to call themselves progressives. If you go to the American Communist Party website, all of the programs and policies they support are progressive. So progressives are anything from a, a hardcore liberal to a communist to a socialist. They all call themselves progressives. And they all have broadly the same values and work together. J. Edgar Hoover is called the masters of deceit. And a good magician raves one hand in the air while he's doing his dirty work with the other hand. And while everybody's saying communism has died, uh, they moved through much of Africa. Communism is resurgent in South Africa. Uh, into South and Central America. Right now, six countries in Latin America are now communistic. We have communist China. Uh, we have Cuba, North Korea. Uh, we have Vietnam. It's still dominates behind the scene in Russia, it's still very strong in Eastern Europe, it's strong in the EU, it is strong in virtually every country in the world. Whitaker Chambers said, the communism succeeds because most people that promote communist causes are not communist. The useful idiots that Lenin called them, it gives it an air of legitimacy it would never have if it was identified with communists and communism. So why has it been so easy for them to get people on the left who aren't communists to push forward their agenda? Once I looked at the political scale, it all started to make sense. On the far left, you have 100% government, and on the far right, zero government. Anarchy is no government and doesn't make sense at all. On the far left, you have socialism, communism, and Nazism. All systems that have a socialist form of government with only slight variances between them. Traditionally, Republicans were slightly to the right of center, and Democrats were slightly to the left. In recent years, though, through the radical influence of the media, Hollywood, and the multitude of Marxist professors in our universities, both parties have slid to the left. With the Democrats going so far, they have openly joined hand in hand with the radicals. That's why they all work together. All the groups on the left now have the same goal, a socialist America. I thought we were over communism. I thought, okay, we won that battle. The Berlin Wall came down. Ronald Reagan won the day. We've got to look and see how he fought this because we're fighting it again on American soil. Not, not hostily attacking us like we feared in the Cold War. It is from within. And it has no opposition. None. And that's the frightening thing. I think it's pretty clear to see communism isn't dead. They now disguise it by calling it different names, but the ideas behind it are alive and well. 
Almost one and a half billion people still live in openly communistic countries. But unfortunately, most of us in America who are under the age of 50 have no idea what communism means to the people who live under it. So my next question was, what's so bad about communism? Communism is so evil. It's a completely uh, tyrannical system. The whole history of communism is, uh, is one of uh, mass murder. Uh, tens of millions of people brutally murdered by the communists. The mass murder of more people in times of peace in all the wars of history combined. Each of those countries where they have taken control, uh, millions have been murdered. When you're asking for what is the legacy of Marxism, it is the greatest killing machine in all of human history. We're talking a congressional record, 135 million dead due to communism. I think the real number is probably when you add in abortions, over 500 million. The rulers lived rather well, and at the same time you had all kinds of people who were enslaved, uh, put in prison, oppressed, uh, so you had uh, really uh, the opposite of what they claimed uh, was going to be the result of their revolutionary activities. You would think that if the 20th century was the most murderous of centuries, everyone would say, let's find out why. And the truth is, you can't even ask the question. It is verboten to ask the question because the ideas that brought about that mass murder uh, are still being taught in our public schools today. I think one of the reasons this has happened is because there's so much confusion surrounding the word communism. Technically speaking, communism is simply the final phase and goal of socialism. And socialism is best described by two words, big government. Government controls almost everything, and they use this power to take things by force from one person and give it to another. The liberals in America sincerely believe that this isn't evil at all. It is what will finally make things fair and just. There's only one problem that pulls some of us away from this wonderful utopian vision. History. From history we see that whether it was Hitler's National Socialism or Stalin's Soviet Socialism, Socialism, by whatever name, and in all its forms, is the ultimate evil. Sooner or later, it destroys everything in its path. Law, morality, family, prosperity, productivity, education, incentive, and finally, life itself. The problem with socialism is that it creates the conditions for a Stalin or a Hitler to come to power. That's why communism has such relevance today. It's the final destination on the road we're traveling. Friedrich Nietzsche tried to convince the world that God was dead. Charles Darwin tried to prove that humans are simply part of the animal kingdom. And Karl Marx realized that the philosophies of Nietzsche and Darwin would legitimize his own philosophy of communism. He knew their ideas would justify the brutality and slaughter that would be necessary to implement communism worldwide. It was in March of 1883, Karl Marx, the father of modern-day communism, died. The assumption that communism would die with him was a logical one, since only nine people attended his funeral. In October of that same year in London, England, a group was forming called the Fabian Socialist Society. The Fabian Socialists decided that they were going to socialize the world uh, incrementally. They called it uh, socialism by evolution instead of Marxist socialism by revolution. It always worked in tandem with the communists. 
Some Fabians were also communists. There was a bit of interchange of membership. The Fabian socialists are slowly but surely bringing about uh, the socialization of the world. Uh, Europe is uh, pretty well done. They are not working in Latin America. Latin America is not just socialistic in many countries. They're all already Marxist. You have a hardcore Marxism in Venezuela, in uh, Nicaragua. El Salvador just went communistic, and of course Fidel is sitting right there laughing at this whole thing. And we haven't even figured this thing out yet. We don't even know there's a, bla a, a red plague coming, coming up to meet us. We think that we're just going to watch the cartoons on Saturday morning and everything will be fine. They had a, uh, a lot to do with bad stuff happening. There are two things I found that gave me a good idea where the Fabians were really coming from. First of all, their symbol was a wolf in sheep's clothing. And secondly, George Bernard Shaw, who was a leader in the Fabians for almost 50 years, said, quote, I am a communist, but not a member of the Communist Party. Stalin is a first-rate Fabian. I am one of the founders of Fabianism, and as such, very friendly to Russia." Unquote. Fabians eventually beget the Students for Democratic Society, which beget the Weather Underground, which beget the, basically the social changes that have happened in America in the last 40 years. Many of the SDS members from the 1960s still have an incredible influence on the direction our country is heading. One is the Reverend Jim Wallace, who was president of SDS when he was a student at Michigan State University. And yet today, he is the spiritual advisor to the President of the United States. They've been friends for many years. They go back to Chicago and the Chicago politics crowd. And during the Vietnam War, he was rooting for the Viet Cong to beat the United States Army. And when they did, he, couldn't, he just couldn't believe it. He said it was one of the happiest days in his life. And another leader in the Students for a Democratic Society and founder of the Weather Underground is William Ayers, who has been a longtime friend and neighbor of President Obama. It came out in 2009 that Obama's book, Dreams from My Father, was even written by Ayers. So the influence from the Fabian Socialist Society goes right into the White House. The next group I've found that has seriously impacted America's culture is the Frankfurt School. The Frankfurt School was a sort of a, an outpost in America of European socialism. Willie Munzenberg, with, with a few other uh, Bolsheviks, founded the Frankfurt School. The two leading members are Herbert Marcuse and Franz Neumann. Franz Neumann was, in fact, a Soviet agent. Their entire purpose was to uh, stand the entire educational system of the West, and the United States in particular, on its head. Bertrand Russell, who worked with the Frankfurt School, said, by using psychological techniques to teach the children, we will be able to produce, quote, an unshakable conviction that snow is black, unquote. They established a school here for the help of John Dewey. He helps bring these German intellectuals to America in 1933, drop them down at Princeton, Berkeley, Brandeis, to go after education and media. Included in those goals were the teaching of homosexuality and sexuality to children, the promotion of excessive drinking, and destruction of religion in the United States. That was a big one. And they basically started the social rot. Willie Munzberg said, we are going to make the West so corrupt it stinks. I love spending time with my family, July 4th, baseball and apple pie, and my mind can't even comprehend that there were groups of intellectuals back in the 1930s plotting and planning how they could make America so corrupt it stinks. There are certain lines and certain limits, and the left has always pushed it as hard as they can, as far as they can, and will protect any pornographer, any deviant, any, cult, any negative cultural form they can find.
basically to degrade the culture. And that goes right along with the feminism of today, which was part of the Frankfurt School's desire to destroy a patriarchal society for a matriarchal society. In other words, remove the father as the loving provider, discipliner, uh, discipler, uh, leader of his home, where you instill virtues and integrity and modesty. That's been broken down on purpose, because they knew if they could destroy the family, they could destroy a nation. And instead of having a father who leads and disciples and protects the home and provides for the family, the government steps in as a nanny state. The Frankfurt School developed the concept of cultural Marxism. Penetrate their culture, take it over, and then everything else will follow. And of course they did that, and today we've had a complete cultural revolution. As many people in America are familiar with the phrase, make love, not war, that actually came from Herbert Mucuza, who was with the Frankfurt School. So these guys went after education, they went for media, and they've been very successful in changing the entire worldview of Americans through what they call political correctness, but it's really cultural Marxism, with the goal being to destroy Christianity, then create chaos, and then move to their ultimate goal, which is from cultural Marxism to traditional Marxism, which is socialism. Most of the strategy to remake America from within started with Antonio Gramsci, who wrote over 2,000 pages back in the 1930s outlining how to take a Judeo-Christian culture down from the inside. The plan he suggested has been the main focus of the left ever since. Antonio Gramsci was a, a neo-Marxist uh, philosopher. Antonio Gramsci was an Italian communist. Antonio Gramsci is probably the, the biggest troublemaker in the world. He's probably got more, more responsibility for our social ills than anybody else on the planet. He knew of the importance of undermining the morals and the character of, of this country. Because America had a strong Christian heritage, you had to uh, attack the culture. You had to change the culture. It's even to pornography and to areas that uh, most people normally wouldn't accept. He said that we're going to destroy the West by destroying its culture. We're going to infiltrate and we're going to turn their music, their art, and their literature against them. That means that you penetrate the universities, uh, you write the books, the novels, the poetry, the music, the book reviews. And once you control the culture, then you can sort of shape the thought of rising generations. He differed with Marx instead of, for example, uh, destroying the church and the other basic institutions. He said infiltrate them and use them to change the culture. What uh, Gramsci had to say was that this is the way that government is perpetuated and society is perpetuated is through these churches because they set the standards, they set the framework of the way people live, of rules, how families should be structured. He didn't want a, a revolution on the streets that would be overturned by the police the next day. He wanted to change society over the long term so that we'd have a revolution without us even realizing it, basically. And the communists have been very effective in promoting their ideology in Hollywood, in the mass media. And I think he was quite right. I think that's exactly what has happened. I think that's the way it's worked. I think it's working that way now. And that's where a lot of these people come from. And that's been the big success story of communism in the last 50 years. It's the professors, it's the educationalists, it's the journalists. They are the shock troops, the Gramscian shock troops of the future. And one of Gramsci's all-star disciples, Saul Alinsky, became one of the most influential radicals of the 1960s. Well, Saul Alinsky was a, he was a prominent radical in, in 1930s Chicago. He worked closely with the Communist Party. He used to go down um, and train at the rifle range with Leon Dupre, who was uh, later a mentor of Barack Obama. And they used to train to shoot because they knew the revolution was just around the corner. But that didn't come, so they, he, he got a bit more subtle. Well, Saul Alinsky called for a um, uh, community organizer to stir things up, to create uh, agitation. In fact, he said, you'll be accused of being an agitator, and that's exactly what you are. He wanted the haves and have-nots fighting with each other. It wasn't until I was watching an old film from World War II that I realized what the left has been doing in America to pit the poor against the rich, blacks against whites, and the young against the old 
is the same tactic Hitler used to disunify Germany. You see, they knew that they were not strong enough to conquer a unified country. So they split Germany into small groups. They used prejudice as a practical weapon to cripple the nation. Remember that when you hear this kind of talk. Somebody is going to get something out of it. And it isn't going to be you. And they use the conflict as justification for more government to stop the chaos. So they create the chaos, and then they step in as a solution to the chaos. And as Francis Schaeffer said, once this chaos comes, most people will willingly give over to a authoritarianism because they don't want the chaos. His book was kind of the field manual, if you will, for these activist organizations. Which President Obama studied and taught at a workshop for four years in Chicago as a community organizer for ACORN. As I was reading through Rules for Radicals to see where he was coming from, I just happened to take a look at the dedication in the front of the book. And this is what I saw. Quote, Lest we forget at least an over-the-shoulder acknowledgement to the very first radical, the first radical known to man who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively that he at least won his own kingdom. Lucifer. Unquote. Saul Alinsky from Antonio Gramsci has had an incredible amount of influence on our president and on our society. And he dedicates his book openly to Lucifer, Satan. I think that says more about where their ideas and plans are based than anything else. You asked what Saul Alinsky's impact is on the leftist movement today and it basically defines it it defines it Saul Alinsky took the best of Gramsci and the best of the Fabian socialist ideas combined repackaged and sold them to the 60s radicals after studying Alinsky Richard Cloward and his wife Francis Fox Piven came up with what is today known as the Cloward Piven strategy now their idea was basically that to destroy society or destroy capitalism per se, they needed to overload the system. It was, the idea was to get everybody you possibly could on welfare, to get everybody you possibly could basically milking the system in some way or another. It was called the crisis strategy and it became very well known by activists and radicals in the 60s. They published an article in the May 1966 issue of Nation magazine called The Weight of the Poor, in which they outlined their strategy. Rathke read that article, and Rathke ended up starting what we now know today as ACORN. And of course, Cloward and Piven had been studying Saul Alinsky. So Antonio Gramsci gives us Saul Alinsky. Saul Alinsky gives us the Cloward Piven strategy, this husband and wife that said, hey, let's collapse the American economy by implementing so many entitlements, so much of a welfare state, it collapse. He, Rathke, studied the Cloward Piven strategy. He starts ACORN. And of course, ACORN gave us Obama. And to show what a small world it is, Wade Rathke, who started ACORN, was the draft resistance organizer for SDS the group the Fabian started. They've used that strategy ever since to expand voting roles, to expand um, welfare roles wherever they can, basically just to overload the system, to increase the tax burden on the middle class, and basically bring capitalism one step closer to destruction. I guess we shouldn't be surprised that we still have open borders, that so many people are dependent on the government, and that the left keeps pushing these programs when all they've done is tear apart the black families in America and create generational cycles of poverty. The last group that has worked alongside the Fabians and the Frankfurt School using Gramsci's approach is the Communist Party USA. Probably the most important book on this subject is called Towards Soviet America by William Z. Foster. William Z. Foster was the head of the Communist Party himself. Uh, he ran for the President of the United States in 1932, but in the book Towards Soviet America, he literally lays out chapter by chapter by chapter what is entailed to bring about a USSA, not just a USSR. 
two of the movements they started in America have played a significant role in tearing apart our families, in breaking down our morality. Uh, Betty Friedan is credited with really starting the feminist movement in this country. The purpose really was to attack full-time homemakers, to get them out of the home, to make them think they live dreary lives, to make women feel they are victims. It's the science of victimology. And um, that is so unfortunate because the American woman is the most fortunate class of people who ever lived on the face of the earth. And to try to tell them that they, they are victims of an oppressive, unjust uh, uh, patriarchy is, is just a, a grievous lie. But unfortunately, they are teaching young women that and have been doing it for many years. While Betty Friedan was pushing her book, Feminine Mystique, she implied that she was coming from the point of being a frustrated housewife herself and just wanted to be a help to other women. But later in the 1990s, it came out, she was in fact a radical propagandist for the Communist Party and a staunch supporter of Stalin. So when she had described the American family as, quote, a comfortable concentration camp, unquote, it wasn't because of her experience at home. It was because she was just doing her part to dismantle our families. I'm a student of communism, and the communists set up gr uh, various groups and various societies. Their society that they set up to promote homosexuality in this country was called the Mattachine Society. And it was founded by Henry Hay, a leading member of the Communist Party. So since I was studying communism and teaching on the, on, on the issue of communism, you just follow leads, and all of a sudden you realize, what is this Mattachine? I've never heard of this Mattachine Society. Well, it was Henry Hayes' organization set up to infiltrate the culture of the United States to make homosexuality normal. It's always been a movement dominated by the left. It's um, all these so-called isms. You will find there's a, there's a communist or a socialist behind every one of them, and you'll, 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 you'll always see the targets. It's, it's basically the traditional family unit. The war is still against the family. If you go back to the Communist Manifesto and read Karl Marx carefully, the war is against what they called the bourgeois family, which was really the biblical family, father, mother, and child. They want to plow through marriage. They want to, they want to change the very definition and meaning of marriage because their open door to engineering society in this utopian way uh, is blocked by the very values of our Christian civilization that's taught through marriage. And so the left just has got to destroy the family because if there's any one thing that will prevent the left from carrying out its agenda, it's healthy and strong nuclear families. And so from the Fabian Socialist Society to the Frankfurt School to Antonio Gramsci and the Communist Party USA, from these four, you will find connections to almost every left-leaning person and organization in America. Their influence has been incredible. It was in the 1960s all the groups on the left seemed to realize Antonio Gramsci was right. In a Judeo-Christian society, you will never be able to persuade people to rise up in a Marxist revolution and start killing each other off. The only way to take the culture down is through penetrating the institutions of influence to change the people from within. I guess the biggest surprise I had while studying these four groups was seeing that a large part of their agenda was trying to make us an immoral people. The communists knew in the, the 1930s and, and since that time, and the leftists uh, know today, that if you can break down the cultural tra traditions, the uh, basic rules of morality, uh, then it's much easier to move people in different directions 
uh, that are counter to the good of society. They recognize that it's all part of the same fabric. Their ideologies all work together to break down families, to break down the sanctity of human life, the value of human life, to break down the idea that there is a God that we are accountable to. They essentially are validating the Judeo-Christian worldview by the very things they attack. Because in their effort to destroy our culture, they know that they have to go after the very things that the Judeo-Christian tradition honors and values. Uh, morality, belief in God, faith, the importance of family, the sanctity of life, uh, the sanctity of marriage. It's amazing our enemies could see our morality was our greatest strength. And yet so many Americans don't seem to get it. Morality is simply having the character to do what you should do instead of what you have the freedom to do. And that's the only way freedom works. A people cannot be given freedom without morality or they will self-destruct. And that's what we see happening in America today. The bottom line is freedom and free enterprise are simply fruit on the tree of morality. Our founding fathers clearly understood this principle and so do our enemies. There is an important fact we need to face. If we had Ronald Reagan as president, low taxes and a strong national defense, the ship certainly wouldn't be sinking as fast as it is now but it would still be sinking. A booming economy doesn't take care of the major problems we face. 50% of all marriages end in divorce. 40% of all children born out of wedlock. Over 3,000 women a day aborting their babies. 19 million new cases each year of sexually transmitted diseases. Schools that teach the children. Everything is relative. There is no right or wrong and the list goes on and on. I recently read in our local paper that over the last 12 months, almost 7% of all high school students in my state tried to commit suicide. Our society is falling apart, whether we want to admit it or not. Karl Marx had the insight to see that dethroning God and destroying capitalism went hand in hand. As you attempt to dethrone God by erasing the morality in a society and destroying his institutions, the family and the church, you are destroying capitalism. Because as the families fall apart and the church loses its influence, society starts to crumble. And then government has to expand to pick up the pieces. The question, as Whitaker Chambers put it, was God or man? God or man? Karl Marx was an atheist. Marx's philosophy was that people existed for the benefit of the state. What Marxism did and does, and all the other isms of the modern era, is to try to dethrone God by deifying man. You have to discredit God. He's your competition. The 20th century ushered in several ideologies that uh, sought to uh, devalue God and elevate man. Communism, relativism, humanism, they all deny that there's a God and uh, they claim that by doing so they're really elevating man. But if you look at how each of those philosophies end up working out in real life, there are always some classes of human beings that don't deserve the same value or rights as anyone else. To turn it around, um, to believe in freedom the way we have been raised, you have to believe that there's something precious about every human person. And of course, that's from the Bible. Imago Dei, we are all created in the image of God. Therefore, uh, every human being is entitled to respect and dignity and freedom and that is distinctive to biblical religion you don't find anywhere else 
Almost all the ideas that have made America such a unique and great country our founding fathers got straight out of the Bible. I guess that's why the left only has a problem with one religion, biblical Christianity. They never complain about separation of church and state when it comes to Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, or any of the other religions. In fact, a couple years ago, the Dalai Lama came to my town, and during the school day, at taxpayers' expense, thousands of our local school children were bussed in to hear him talk. I wonder if they would ever do that for someone like Billy Graham. No, they must destroy the Bible's influence in America so they can step in with big government in its place. It's an age-old question. Are we going to believe in God or are we going to play God ourselves? Essentially for the left, the choice that they see very clearly is people are going to depend upon God or they are going to depend upon government. They want people to depend upon government, so they have to destroy faith in God. At its core, it's a rebellion against God and God's uh, laws. And that's what the battle is about. That's what the assault is, is on. That's why Christianity is, is, uh, is a target. And that's why we saw the gulags in the Soviet Union. We saw the concentration camps in Nazi Germany. And all the uh, ideologies that elevate man end up devaluing certain human beings. Dictators of the left, Hitler, Stalin, Mao, Castro, and all the others, always have come to power by acting like they're going to change things to make it better for the people. Yet history has shown us the devastating results that have happened every single time. There is no example in history of big government that didn't abuse its power over the people. But people who have believed in the God of the Bible and that our rights are a gift from Him to everyone have always stood up for the preciousness of every human life. You look at those who have fought for true human rights throughout the ages, and it's those that do have a strong faith in God, those who fought against slavery, and those now today who are fighting for the sanctity of human life. Like the declaration says, all these truths will be self-evident, all men are created equal. Aristotle didn't believe that. He said no, some people are born to be slaves and some other people are born to rule over them. And the reason that you and I know different is not because we're smarter than Aristotle. He's a smart man. But we have something he didn't have. We have the Bible. And so, therefore, that's where we get these ideas. And, and from pagan antiquity or neo-paganism or all the modernisms, you, you get the opposite. After studying this topic for the last two years and reading literally hundreds of their books and articles and speeches, I've come to the conclusion, whether the left knows it or not, their plans and goals can all be summed up very simply. They are at war with God. A people that are moral and believe their rights come from God would not only never want what they're selling, but would also never need it. And they know that. It's obvious if you're trying to trying to subvert a country. You want to control the news. You want to control public opinion. And a lot of people realize, well, there's a biased media, and most people know that. Even the Washington Post admitted it. Yeah, we were biased for Obama, so what? And when you enter into the equation, so what? That means the biases, the opinions of the reporters, enter into what is news. They decide whether you have a right to know. And it's no longer a bias. They turn from just, from just political bias to activism. They go to the places that influence, or I should say, where they can have leverage. Generations of journalists have been trained to interpret events, interpret the news, not report the facts, interpret the news. They do not deal in facts because facts aren't effective for them. They have very few facts on their side. 
they've gone into and penetrated these major areas to where they can influence it in the direction they want to go. We've seen a massive shift away from old-fashioned objective news reporting to what he called interpretive reporting, what others call advocacy journalism. And it's advocacy for a cause. And as a result, we have a news media in the United States that is extremely liberal at the present time. Which was a, a major, major goal to control not merely the newsprint, but the television media and, and Hollywood. Stalin said himself, if I could control Hollywood, I could rule the world. Children are always the first targets of anybody trying to bring down a system. John Dewey is believed to be the most influential man in the whole area of public education. He uh, went to Russia in 1928 to help study the Karl Marx way of education, bring it back to America. Dewey was a, an atheist. He was a, a socialist, a humanist. He was part of the Socialist Society in America, helped found that. What he believed in was that education should socialize the child to make him uh, a, a willing tool of the state. It might be surprising to some that the man who is still idolized as the father of public education in America is the very man who did everything in his power to dumb down our children so that they would willingly accept his vision of a socialist America. It started with Dewey in the early 1900s. It expanded, um, really expanded since the 1960s. The hard left gets control of the teachers unions and the training colleges. If you've got those two institutions, you can pretty much dictate all educational policy. The people who were uh, demonstrating against our country and against our government in the 1960s have now become tenured professors in the universities. So they're the ones who are writing the textbooks, uh, teaching the teachers, uh, running the teachers' colleges. And it's self-perpetuating, because once you have the universities, then you train more cadres and more and more and more. And they discovered that they could uh, do more to remake our country by going into the schools uh, than they could by throwing bombs. I believe the average patriotic American underestimates the importance and influence education has on their children. That's how the large majority we had in 1980 to elect Ronald Reagan in a landslide has been lost. It's not because the other side has had lots of children. No, they're boarding theirs. But instead, they're capturing ours through the propaganda they teach them seven hours a day for 13 years and even longer if they attend college. We are losing most of our children to the other side because of the anti-American, anti-God, and anti-free enterprise rhetoric they are filled with in the government schools. Government schools are not teaching basic reasoning processes. They're not teaching logic. They're not teaching actual data of history and science and mathematics. And if your education is rather limited, then you're inclined to believe that government can be the solution to your problems. When you look at the desks in the schoolroom, you'll find four together or maybe a table, they sit around a table. Independent desks are very rare in most classrooms because they don't want to promote the self-sufficiency, independent mindset. You go back to William Z. Foster in his book, Towards Soviet America, you will see how uh, he has whole chapter there on how we have to supplant education in this country and ultimately force every student to attend public school. That's the other thing. I hope the homeschoolers get, catch on to this. The homeschoolers and the Christian day school movement are going to have some very rough times ahead of them because the public school crowd it cannot afford to have any competition. And they're, having, and they're being given plenty of competition by the homeschoolers right now. You see the effects of that in lowered educational standards. There's no more studying of the classics or studying of the civics or 
you know, how the US Constitution was formed. It's, it's all progressive education. It's all based on the identity politics, the isms, the current trendy isms, environmentalism, racism. They're training them for the collective and a collective mindset and a dependency mindset. And it seems that they, again, want to have people be uneducated, so then they do become wards of the state. They're dependent on the government to provide everything for them. It's under 10% of kids believe that, that there is an absolute right and an absolute wrong. And how, why are we surprised? We've sent our kids into this government system that indoctrinates them, that teaches them about tolerance and diversity and multiculturalism and not about reading, writing, and arithmetic, not about what our founding fathers had to say. It's, it's consequences. Few would argue that the education the children are receiving in the public schools is pathetic at best. But with the amount of tax dollars we spend each year, over twice as much as it would cost to send the students to private school, why do we allow this to continue? The group that my investigation led me to that seems dedicated to making sure the children don't get a good education was a real shocker. Uh, the uh, schools are are pretty much controlled by the teachers union, the National Education Association. If you look at their platform and goals, uh, you would think they were a socialist or almost communistic organization. They are for the entire feminist agenda, uh, starting with abortion on demand, tax-funded abortions. They're for the whole gay rights agenda. Uh, they're for the whole globalism agenda. They are extremely anti-parent. It, it, is a, it is an effort to get the children to abandon the values of their parents. National Education Association has no uh, patience, tolerance, or use for traditional teachers. They're looking for people who want to be agents of change. They want to throw out all the lessons of history. And really, it's an attempt to then impose their own views and ideas onto people, get them to act as activists. If you control those institutions, then you can control everything else. It's all public schools, all for their jobs, and they have gotten behind all of the radical kinds of curriculum that's being introduced. They're for it a hundred percent. They've had a tremendous effect on public education. It's not positive. We also see immorality being promoted through our schools, the kind of sex ed curriculum that is being used and paid for with our tax dollars would shock most parents. I think one of the main problems we face is parents naively thinking that the schools are the same today as they were when they were young. They don't realize there is a battle going on in this country for the hearts and minds of our children. The game is between 15 and 25 years of age. That's the whole game. If you're over 25, the chances are they're going to put a few pennies towards you to corrupt you. But their game right now is to corrupt the 15 to 25 year olds or less. And right now they're down in the first grade with Heather has two mommies, daddy's roommate, uh, gay pride parade. And now by eighth grade, they'll pass out condoms and school colors because that's so patriotic. And it's perfectly obvious that you get a hold of the child early. You can change his values away from his parents' values and get him to follow you. And they're very open about saying that. The National Education Association has passed a resolution saying they want children from birth. Isn't that interesting? The Communist Manifesto also thought the state should take control of children at birth. The left has always been good at disguising their real agenda by coming up with phrases made from words we are very familiar with, but then giving them new definitions. Social justice is the current phrase of choice and is being used to teach children the failed Marxist ideas of yesteryear or what they should strive for today. We see social justice curriculum today, which is the buzzword for communism, socialism, Marxism, which Bill Ayers is teaching. It's in many of our colleges and the social justice curriculum is being taught in high schools all over the nation. Justice is good. If you then start calling something blank justice, then you're modifying it. And what it really means is, I think, taking from one group of people and giving to another group. So I would call it socialism. 
and it's used to uh, break down the differences between the way things are done and the way it should be done. So when they're teaching social justice in the schools, they're not talking about free enterprise and capitalism and individual self-responsibility, all the things that made America great. They're talking about the things that made, it, made Europe and the Soviet Union and China so bad. The longer we allow our schools to teach the children that America has so many faults, it's not worth saving, instead of the fact that even with its faults, it is the greatest country that has ever existed, the less chance we have of ever turning our people back from the dead-end road we're currently on. A road that promises to give us a perfect world if we'll only give up our sovereignty and our freedom. You're going to find more and more of the following. This is now called a world pledge. We no longer want the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America because that is considered nationalistic and of course the socialist communists and the Marxist and the extreme left wing in the country uh, want nothing to do with it. I pledge allegiance to the world to care for earth, sea and air, to honor every living thing with peace and justice everywhere. This came out first of all in Superior, Wisconsin. So Superior, Wisconsin was their guinea pig and there was very little uh, set against it and so it would then go to the next and the next and the next and before long you have the whole school system standing up saying I pledge allegiance to the world instead of I pledge allegiance to the US. The public schools right now if you'll read towards Soviet America have nearly accepted every item that William Z. Foster said we needed to place into the public school curriculum and we're seeing the results, you know. People are not as informed as they once were. They think in different ways, and they think in the way that the left intends them to think. Antonio Gramsci realized that if you can take over the institutions and the culture, you will be able to use those to influence society to create the socialist man you want. I think the most brilliant part of his plan was that he realized you could not only create a man that wanted big government to take care of him cradle to grave, but, and this is the genius of Gramsci, you could create a man that needed big government to take care of him cradle to grave. A man so dumbed down and so minimized in society, he wouldn't have the intellect or character to take care of himself. The reason this is so deadly for America is that once we have a certain percentage of the population in that category, our limited constitutional form of government is no longer possible because too many people won't be able to exist in that framework. We are approaching that tipping point rapidly. If you can persuade people that government should be in control of the distribution and use of energy, you can persuade them, or rather, you have persuaded them of the necessary and sufficient condition for government control of the most intimate aspects of our lives. One of the main uh, thrusts of socialism these days is obviously through the environmental movement. You know, one hates to pick on Al Gore too quickly and easily, uh, but I read the whole of his book, Earth in the Balance, Ecology and the Human Spirit, back in 1992 when it was first published. And if you, if you know anything about the history of political philosophy, you, you read the last chapter in that called A Global Marshall Plan, and you understand that there is no way to implement what Al Gore was calling for in 1992 in that book except by means of totalitarian world government. Patrick Moore, who was a co-founder of Greenpeace, and he was a very dedicated environmentalist, quit Greenpeace when he realized that it had been captured 
by radical leftists who were intent on using the environmental movement as a vehicle to destroy capitalism. How many factories work when there's a power outage? None. You want to hurt business, you want to drive down industrial production, you just drive up the prices of energy, you just diminish its availability, and the easiest way to do that is to make people scared to death of the cheapest forms of energy, which are fossil fuels, oil, coal, natural gas, and nuclear energy. They had already made people afraid of nuclear because of irrational fears of, of uh, nuclear reactor meltdowns, which were physically impossible anyway. Uh, but then they had to figure out a way to make them afraid of, of fossil fuels. Well, the way to do that was to say they're going to cause catastrophic global warming. So I used to think this was just one great big distraction. If they want to end, put their energies toward the environment, but now I see that this is now being turned around and used as a tool to further a socialist agenda. Charles Rubin, a political scientist who wrote the book The Green Crusade, has told this story extremely well. Environment comes from a French word meaning surroundings. Well now, what is surroundings? Everything around you, right? And so as Rubin points out, environmentalism is literally everythingism. And so if you were a socialist committed ideologically to the notion of government having control of everything about our lives, and you saw that you were losing the contest in terms of the creation of wealth and its distribution to capitalism, you had to find some other basis on which to promote your vision of government and to pursue its implementation. Environmentalism, or everythingism, was the perfect card. In December of 2009, when the Climategate scandal broke open and it became public that even the leaders of the movement knew the whole global warming idea was a farce, it wasn't them just having bad data, we as Americans knew once and for all that this movement was simply part of their agenda. It's my guess that regardless of the evidence that comes out against them, they will not let this tool they have waited the last hundred years for go to waste. A tool that gives them the absolute power and control they want, but allows them to get it under the guise of saving the planet. He was born of left-wing parents. He was mentored as a young man by a Communist Party member called Frank Marshall Davis. Now Davis joined the Communist Party in Chicago and he was very well connected there. So young Obama eventually wound up in Chicago and he started working with the very same people that had been working with his friend Frank Marshall Davis. All of his associations have been with people that are way left to center, hardcore left. And he, he's doing nothing more than, than what is predictable based upon that background. The nicest word for his agenda is the socialist agenda, and we could go on down the line of the, le the other descriptors of the, the types of an economy and a society that he's building. He's all the things that Gramsci wanted to use for social change. Yeah, he's the epitome of the movement. If you think there's no way that so few could be so effective, consider this. When the Communist Party USA split in 1992, the group that formed was the Committees of Correspondence, and it was their meeting I attended that summer at Berkeley. As I started researching that group, I saw that many of the same people who started or have worked with the Committees of Correspondence and its sister organizations were the same people who were involved with President Obama's campaign and administration. I found file after file on Trevor Loudon's website documenting with footnotes and photographs these connections. The radical left has been so successful they have persuaded the American people to put one of their own in the White House. 
socialism and Marxism go together like Mary and Mary's little lamb. The general populace knows very little about what, what the socialists are up to. If you're going to find socialism, you're going to find the, you're going to find the hardcore communists right behind it. One of the main avenues has been through what they call it the Congressional Progressive Caucus. 20% of the US Congress are members of this organization. They have chairmanships of, of most of the major house committees and are, are easily the single most powerful bloc in the US Congress. And virtually all of them are tied to either Democratic Socialists of America, the Communist Party USA, or other radical organizations. We're literally at this very time watching what's transpiring and has been going on from the Fabian Socialist point of view from 1883 to the present. So these guys don't give up. And they're going at a breakneck speed because they know they've got an opportunity now to change America in a way that can never be changed back and they're going for broke. The Bolsheviks, they're just waiting in the woods and they're just smiling like you can't believe. You just read the Communist Party USA uh, blog and they just can't believe their good fortune. Every time they turn around, they just can't believe this is happening. They're like me. I'm a Christian conservative and I can't believe they, they've been so successful in doing this. The left has started multitudes of foundations and nonprofit organizations, many of which are using our tax dollars to grind America down. They use all kinds of patriotic words uh, to masquerade an extreme leftist uh, orientation, uh, which, if anything, would uh, enslave the people uh, in uh, the same kinds of things with the same kind of ultimate results as communism had. The communists will let the socialists go so far, and then ultimately the communists really turn on their fellow socialists and they wipe them out too. Uh, and their attitude, I think, is really uh, probably pretty close. They figure, look, if these socialists betrayed their own country, the chances are, once we get in power, they'll betray us too. So they'll figure, let's just rub them out right now. And at, at a given point, you'll see in the history of communism that they've been very effective in rubbing out their fellow socialists who brought about their socialism before the Bolsheviks and the, and the hardcore uh, communists with a capital C took them over. One thing we do really have to recognize is this is a domestic enemy. This is not just people with different ideas. These are not just nice folks who have funny, silly ideas that they will eventually figure out are just not very mature. No, these people are dangerous, dangerous enemies and they are intent on overthrowing this country and imposing a socialist system that will mean extreme hardship for the vast majority of people in this country. That's true with them constantly seeking to re-engineer society so they reach this level of utopian perfection. Where we on the other side, um, we, we advance the idea that this is about the cause of freedom. And if it hadn't been for Jesus Christ, there never would have been a United States of America. Because the inspiration for freedom drove our founding fathers. They were informed by their faith and I believe guided by the hand of God. No. No. Perhaps uh, treacherously close. It is never over until it's over. When the fat lady sings, isn't that the slogan? And when the fat lady sings, it's over. Now, she might be clearing her throat. We saw the great country of Germany in the 1920s brought to its knees. Hitler came into power and destroyed the country. We see countries like Zimbabwe in Africa, which was once a prosperous breadbasket now just wrecked. Argentina was, was destroyed by the socialist Peron in the 50s. It was one of the richest countries in the world. So, no, we're not at the point of no return, but it's, it's getting pretty late in the day. There's, not, it's, there's no time to be casual, that's for sure. We've spent too many years thinking, because we have Republicans in office, or the stock market is doing well, that everything's okay. This is why the left has gained so much ground. It doesn't matter who's been in office. They've just continued pushing forward with their agenda. Well, I believe this is our last chance to push back.
If people are looking for something to do, we have our work cut out for us. I believe one of the things that we can do that will have a profound impact in changing America is praying. Well, as soon as we get off our knees, we need to get on our feet. Become educated about what's going on in the country. Spend time reading. Understand their philosophy and their goals. They have to master this documentary. They have to go over it a dozen times. It might be having a monthly movie night with family and friends, watching one of the many great documentaries out there about what is going on in our country. One of the things that I think uh, people in the, in the United States who believe in our country, believe in our values, can do, quite frankly, is stand up for those values, uh, to make their views known. And there's times that you've got to speak up, and you've got to call things what they are. We need to be willing to be criticized and to not be silent because of the criticism. It was Martin Luther who said, if we're faithful on all battle fronts besides, it's precisely where the battle's the hottest, then we're traitors to the cause. I like the quote by Abraham Lincoln who said that silence makes cowards out of the best of men. And we got a lot of people that need to be speaking up right now. We have an obligation to speak the truth about the policies that are taking us 180 degrees from God's, God's will. Expand within your church. Expand within the people you have contact. Bring them up to speed and knowledge on what's going on. We need to organize those around us by simply mobilizing the unique groups of people we are in contact with and being their source of information, we can have an extraordinary effect. Lenin said that the organized minority will beat the disorganized majority every time. Why should we be buying products from companies that are going to fund organizations that attack our values. They need to uh, be really smart in using the mass media. They might want to blog. Using the power of, of YouTube and that sort of thing to educate as many people as possible. A good YouTube video can reach millions of people. And um, if Susan Boyle can do it, why can't we? If you do the right kinds of things on YouTube that are creative and do them frequently, you can drive a message through society influencing millions at almost no cost. We need to be the people who graciously but consistently make contact. And express to those folks we elected what we want them to do, and what we believe in, what we think is right. And if they don't follow those things, then we need to make efforts to get them out and get other people in that will. Pick the good ones and stick to them. Don't waste your time on people who won't stand up for their country. All the others are making contact. The people who really want to honor America need to make contact. We also need to be influencing our own families. We've got to teach our own children and grandchildren the difference between truth and error, why they believe the things they do, and the true source of America's greatness. If what we're talking about is true, the most important thing we can do is protect our young, because that is where all of this is leading. They need to get that younger generation under their belt. And more and more parents are going to have to say, they're just going to have to sacrifice and take responsibility for their kids' edu education, because that's really where it starts, to impart that belief. The Southern Baptists, we're seeing that 85% of their kids, after they get out of their home, are essentially rejecting their faith, rejecting what they were taught. And of course, I think the reason for that is because their parents didn't have a lot of influence over them. I believe the public schools are the greatest cultural influence in this country. You homeschool your kids or get them in a Christian day school. If there is any way at all, homeschool your children. Homeschoolers outtest everybody. Our children need to be taught from Scripture a properly biblical worldview. That requires time. It requires effort. It requires purpose. Our minds should be the sharpest minds in the world. We need to work within our family to educate our children on what kind of country they live in and build their faith and then get involved. The left has been working for decades to push us away from God and His laws. And we need to be willing to sacrifice whatever it takes to turn our country back to Him. Throughout our history as Americans, though, there has always been a great price to be paid for preserving, protecting, and defending this great land.
the people who built America paid a great price. Uh, the, the people who went to war for our nation, boy, did they pay a price. And one of the American values was, we will pay a price for what is right. We will give of ourselves, even if it requires the giving of our lives. That was an American value. That's why it is such a heroic and honorable thing when a soldier defending us pays that price. That's like when you go to Arlington Cemetery in Washington or the Tomb of the Unknown. You stand there and you say, this is America. We were the people who so believed in these values that it's an honor to stand for, even if it can cost you your very life. One thing I think we knew, do need to remember, though, is that as we look at those we consider to be heroes in the past, they weren't people who just went along with the status quo. They weren't people who were just saying what was accepted at that time in history. They were people who were rising up above the evil that was being committed in their culture at that time. That's why they were heroes, because they weren't like everyone else. Never ever lose sight of the power of one individual American. They, have, they can have an unbelievable magnifying effect just by the very fact they make up their mind to do so. The hope is in this, as Francis Schaeffer said, that as the dull ache of the human soul can no longer be filled with material prosperity, people are going to turn to spiritualism. Will it be pagan spirituality or biblical Christianity? We know according to the Denver Post, June of 2008, pagan spirituality is doubling in America every 18 months. So we better get out there because I'll tell you, pagan spirituality and Christianity will both get you to God. The one who will get you there is your judge, that is your savior. If we humble ourselves, we fall to our knees, if we seek his face, we pray and we turn from our wicked ways that we have a chance for God to hear from heaven, to forgive our sins and heal our land. Uh, and if we are being judged, then we need to use this as an opportunity to show people that uh, this judgment in this life is nothing compared to the judgment that's to come, that's to come that's eternal, and really make them understand the importance of uh, fleeing God's wrath by accepting Him, repenting of their sins through faith and repentance. I believe that's the only chance, the only hope we have as a nation. Hope is not found in rhetoric. Hope is found in God, the God of creation. And you know what? Our founders were in covenant with that God. You need a dedicated, informed, praying Christian making things happen and being determined to do so. Time has only allowed me to present a fraction of what I found. The reason I called this film Agenda is because I wanted to make a clear distinction between what I was researching and all the conspiracy theories out there. The dictionary says a conspiracy is an evil plan formulated in secret by two or more persons, but an agenda is simply a list of things to be done. At every turn of my investigation, I have found agendas by people and groups of the left outlining their plan in their own words. They've been doing most of this right out in the open. Some of you might be thinking, these Marxist ideas aren't the most serious threat we face. What about militant Islam, our open borders, the national debt, or even China? Well, I agree. America is facing so many serious threats right now. But the reason I believe this is the most dire is because it's destroying us on the inside. Through the political correctness and dumbing down, it's causing us to lose our ability to call evil evil and stand against it. I fear for our country. If we go along business as usual, not informed, not aware of what's going on, then the very small minority that have a plan and are great at organizing the uninformed and misguided will make sure their plan is carried out. I hope you realize it won't just be your children and grandchildren that pay the horrific price of living in the society they're trying to create. No, it will be far worse than that. 
Every time a, a civilization goes down or a country goes down militarily or economically, somebody else fills the gap. Now, if you look around the world now, it's going to be China, which is massively arming. You've got, the, you've got Russia, which is becoming increasingly belligerent. You've got the radical Islamic world, which is, works hand in glove with the Russians and the Chinese all the time. You've got a virtually red Latin America. Um, you've got a neutral socialist Europe. So America hasn't got a lot of friends left in the world. Now, that's just not going to affect America. That's going to affect every single remaining country in the free world. Who's going to stand up to China if America doesn't? Who's going to stand up to the Russians? Is Europe going to do it? Australia, New Zealand, Canada? Not a chance. If America, and this is the point I think Americans need to comprehend. If America goes down economically, it will go down militarily. If America goes down militarily, we all go down. The free world is finished, and it will be finished for a very, very long time.